Good evening. Uh, we are the last panel of a very long day, so we're going to try to keep you awake. Um, I'm Laurent cohen tanuji I have the honor and the pleasure of moderating this, uh, this panel. I'm an international corporate lawyer based in, uh, based in Paris. And uh, I will maybe start with a word of explanation about, about our topic tonight, which is the weaponization of law and globalization. So many people ask me, what, what is this about? So, of course, you can uh, object to this title that, that law uh, has always been a weapon. When you go to court, you use law uh, against your <coughs> adversary in a, in a litigation. Um, also, if you take the long <coughs> view of history throughout centuries, uh, law has been used by <coughs> sovereign powers uh, to legitimize or justify even the most uh, horrible actions. So you would say, what, what, what's new? Uh, well, <coughs> what is new, um, in, in my view, and I think uh, probably some of our, uh, all of our panelists, is that we, are, we seem to be moving from an area uh, from the <coughs> end of World War II, the past 70 years, where law has been a key to uh, the building of uh, an international world order that based on the rule of law and that has been uh, thanks to both <coughs> the United States and, and the European community in the European Union, we seem to be moving from that rule-based international order to a <coughs> more chaotic uh, <coughs> system of international relations where law seems to be more and more used as a uh, pretext uh, for <coughs> arbitrary or unilateral action. And so I guess our topic is, is that, is that so? And if true, is that evolution um, troublesome for, is that a new, a new threat, a new impediment to, to globalization? So to address <coughs> these questions, uh, we have a, a panel of, of very distinguished um, uh, members, uh, most of them lawyers, but not all. Um, and so I will introduce very briefly, since we have very little time and a lot to say, I will refer you to uh, the brochure for the complete biography, but in a <coughs> very briefly, uh, ladies first, uh, Antida Nohodom at the, <coughs> at the far left here, who is, I would describe as a rising star in uh, public international law uh, academia. Uh, <coughs> then uh, Michael Muller, who has a, had a brilliant career in the uh, UN system, uh, had a number of positions um, in, the, in the UN system. Uh, <coughs> Yi Min Lee, who had a uh, brilliant diplomatic career in Korea, uh, in particularly in the international economic and trade uh, area. He uh, negotiated the uh, both the EU, uh, Korea, and US, Korea free trade agreement. And, and then finally, uh, Stu Eisenstadt, uh, who you all uh, know, who was a <coughs> close advisor to President Carter, wrote a great biography of him recently, and uh, <coughs> was also US ambassador to the, uh, to the EU. So I will uh, maybe uh, start by illustrating uh, what I was just talking about, this uh, troublesome uh, shift from a rule-based order toward a, 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 more, uh, a more chaotic <coughs> order with uh, a, a, a maybe an abuse of, of the legal system. In my area, which is uh, international business law and international uh, criminal law, um, and of course many of you uh, think about the issue of uh, the extraterritorial application of national law and particularly of, of US law when, uh, when we uh, talk about, uh, we, when we think about the weaponization of law. I happen to think that extraterritoriality as such uh, is, not, is not an issue. In fact, I think that in a globalized economy, uh, the extraterritorial application of, of US and other any national law is, uh, is actually the, the, the norm. And in fact, the European Union also applies its laws extraterritorially. The only difference is that the US has a <coughs> more powerful enforcement tools, 
Uh, and so at least in the areas where there is an international consensus, uh, like for example, in the fight against uh, international corruption where there is an OECD convention, the fact that <coughs> the United States uh, tend to enforce its uh, Foreign Corrupt Pract Practices Act, its national anti-corruption law more vigorously abroad uh, doesn't, doesn't shock me. Um, <coughs> when there is in rather uh, instead a policy split like in the uh, uh, recent Iranian sanctions of the US, then it, it is a, more of a concern uh, because there's no international consensus. Um, but what is more troublesome, and I think is more, and what is more recent and illustrative of the, of the trend I was, uh, I was describing, which is the, the subject of our panel, is what I would call the geopoliticization of <coughs> international business law, and in particular, criminal law. And this geopoliticization, I think, is due to uh, three phenomena. First, the, the targeting of individuals uh, and particularly corporate executives, uh, in addition to uh, corporations themselves. Uh, that was that's a trend that was started by, by the US uh, enforcement authorities, but is now spreading uh, as, a <coughs> as a result of the financial crisis. There's a criticism that the CEOs of all these banks that <coughs> created so much trouble were never actually uh, indicted or, or, or jailed. And so there's a trend towards targeting the individual executive. The second trend, of course, in the global economy is the rise of emerging powers who do not have a rule of law tradition. Uh, I don't need to cite them, you, you know uh, those I'm talking about. And then uh, the third factor is, of course, the growing conflictuality of, <coughs> of, the, of international relations. So if you put those three things together, you have a situation like uh, the Huawei uh, situation where uh, Huawei uh, CFO is uh, <coughs> arrested in, in, in Vancouver uh, from <coughs> by, uh, by um, instruction of the, of the US authorities, which <coughs> uh, provokes retaliation and then China uh, detains two uh, Canadian nationals who have nothing to do with, with, with this or, or anything else. Uh, a French uh, banker is, is arrested in, in Russia. Uh, and I could, I could and the, maybe the Carlos Ghosn affair, even though it's not a, so much a political, but it's sort of corporate politics uh, in a system that, that is uh, in a criminal law system that, uh, that is uh, uh, at odds with uh, uh, most Western uh, criminal justice system. So all of those things, all of these evolutions are, are, are quite uh, troublesome and I think are, are, are becoming a, a threat to, uh, to globalization. Another example would be the use of uh, anti-corruption laws by notoriously corrupt countries uh, who enact them and then use them as they please against either political opponents or against uh, selective, uh, selectively against foreign, uh, foreign investors. So we seem to be moving from a, a rule of law based system to a system of, of arbitrariness and, and, and force. And so uh, that, uh, that is, I think, what, uh, what we should be concerned about. So to uh, uh, deepen that analysis, I would like to give the floor first to Antida to maybe give us a little uh, doctrinal approach to this phenomenon. And uh, Antida, please, the floor, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup, Laurent. Uh, J'en profite pour remercier Thierry Montbrial pour uh, cette invitation à, à participer une nouvelle fois à cette uh, très belle conférence. Uh, je uh, vais donc vous présenter, je vais faire ma, ma présentation en, en français, parce que nous avons la chance d'avoir des, des interprètes. Euh, présenter les, euh, le, le cadre doctrinal de l'utilisation du, du droit comme arme avec une présentation théorique et historique du concept de l'offert. Alors, cette session va euh, principalement traiter des aspects euh, économiques de l'utilisation du droit comme arme et euh, puisqu'il s'inscrit dans le euh, cadre de l'étude de la mondialisation, mais cette utilisation stratégique du droit se produit dans un cadre bien plus large que ce contexte économique et elle a d'ailleurs débuté dans le domaine militaire bien avant d'atteindre euh, le domaine économique. 
Mon propos est euh, d'appréhender le cadre théorique et historique euh, de, du thème de cette session par une brève présentation du concept de « lawfare », Néologisme venant de la contraction des termes de « law » et « warfare », autrement dit « la guerre par le droit ». Alors, qu'est-ce que « lawfare » La première utilisation de ce terme a été faite par le major Charles Dunlap en 2001, dans la publication d'un écrit où il définissait le, le « lawfare » comme « the use of the law and the legal process as a weapon in modern warfare, either to achieve a military objective or to deny an objective to the enemy ». La définition telle qu'elle avait été proposée en 2001 a été élargie pour inclure la manipulation illicite du système juridique pour atteindre des objectifs politiques ou militaires stratégiques. Aujourd'hui, il n'y a pas de consensus sur la signification du « lawfare euh, ». La propagation du terme « lawfare » s'est produite en marge de la guerre contre le terrorisme menée par les États-Unis, bien qu'elle ne soit plus aujourd'hui limitée à ces euh, événements. Dans un tel contexte, le droit a évolué pour décrire et dénoncer diverses formes d'engagement juridique international. Souvent, mais pas exclusivement, euh, ces usages, ces usages pardon, sont euh, le fait d'acteurs euh, non étatiques, les individus, euh, des organisations non gouvernementales, des institutions internationales ou des groupes militants euh, sous étatiques. Il s'agit pour eux d'imposer et de manipuler des normes juridiques, en particulier internationales, afin de limiter les moyens et les opérations militaires traditionnelles, mais aussi de limiter les réactions des États, par exemple face au terrorisme, limiter aussi l'usage de la force. Dans ces dernières évolutions, le label « lawfare » décrit l'utilisation stratégique de la maîtrise de l'information par les États dans le but d'atteindre un objectif particulier, souvent militaire, mais aussi économique, d'où le rôle prépondérant des nouvelles technologies dans la propagation de ce phénomène. Le « lawfare » désigne alors l'utilisation du droit comme arme de propagande, un moyen pour mobiliser l'opinion publique, et le concept de l'offert a été tellement euh, étendu qu'il est aujourd'hui dévoyé, puisqu'il a même été euh, invoqué pour dénoncer les ingérences euh, du politique dans euh, l'élaboration euh, de la règle, ou encore euh, l'exercice de la justice nationale dans le cadre d'États euh, démocratiques. Alors on va limiter ici le concept à l'utilisation du droit à des fins stratégiques de déstabilisation de l'ennemi. Deux exemples historiques du lawfare. D'abord, l'utilisation du lawfare dans le cadre des actions militaires américaines en Irak en 2003, qui ont donné lieu à une bataille juridique sur la légitimation et la délégitimation de, de cette intervention, notamment par les ONG, qui souhaitaient montrer l'illégalité de cette action afin de délégitimer, délégitimer pardon, le, le pouvoir. Deuxième exemple, euh, le lawfare a été utilisé par euh, les groupes islamistes pour condamner les violations des euh, droits de l'homme opérées par euh, les États-Unis à Guantanamo ou euh, par les Européens afin de restreindre euh, l'information publique euh, sur euh, l'islam radical. Alors, quels enseignements peut-on tirer de ce, ces exemples D'abord, le fait que le droit tend à être utilisé comme une arme contre les pays où l'état de droit est fort. Et deuxième enseignement, il est plus souvent utilisé dans des relations ou des guerres asymétriques afin d'influencer la perception du public à l'étranger, d'obtenir un avantage moral et politique sur l'ennemi pour compenser un désavantage militaire ou économique. Alors ce phénomène illustre une mutation de l'art de la guerre, alors même si ce phénomène a toujours existé, d'utiliser le droit comme, comme arme, on sait que la guerre ne se gagne pas forcément uniquement avec le succès des armées. On observe aujourd'hui une amplification et une diversification du phénomène qui atteint la sphère économique et ne se limite plus à la sphère militaire. Trois manifestations de cette mutation que vous pouvez voir sur la diapo. D'abord, première manifestation, on voit une nécessité politique de justifier par le droit les interventions militaires auprès de l'opinion publique nationale et internationale. 
De manière plus générale, euh, les débats soulevant des enjeux politiques sont repris et formulés euh, en termes légaux parce que le droit est considéré comme étant un langage supposé neutre et euh, consensuel, ce qui en réalité n'est ne, pas le cas. Il y a d'ailleurs dans des discours une confusion entre légalité et légitimité. Enfin, le phénomène repose également sur la mutation technologique du numérique dans la sphère civile et militaire qui facilite la diffusion de l'argumentation juridique utilisée. Alors, quelles sont les techniques du lawfare Il y a trois techniques, principalement. L'engagement de poursuites devant les tribunaux du système international et des systèmes internes. On a, par exemple, utilisé le lawfare pour décrire le dépôt de plaintes pour diffamation contre les experts de la lutte contre le terrorisme, afin de les décourager de rendre leur expertise. L'utilisation aussi abusive de la terminologie juridique pour manipuler l'opinion publique, les institutions internationales, influencer cette opinion publique. Et enfin, peut-être la, la, la portée extraterritoriale du droit national, qui est une nouvelle technique du lawfare. Euh, et on le voit des illustrations dans le domaine des sanctions économiques, euh, dans l'usage de la compétence universelle ou encore plus récemment dans le cadre de la protection des données à caractère personnel. Alors, la, la question qu'on peut se poser, c'est est-ce qu'il s'agit d'une pathologie euh, que l'on devrait absolument traiter ou une, une évolution inhérente à la société euh, internationale L'utilisation des euh, nouvelles technologies et le fait euh, facilite la mobilisation de l'opinion publique et la désinformation, et en ce sens, le lawfare est inhérent à la société euh, internationale. De même, la mondialisation accroît les interdépendances entre les États euh, et la dimension transnationale des activités qui y sont euh, menées, et donc le lawfare, en utilisant l'extraterritorialité euh, des lois, joue sur l'interdépendance des euh, économies. Enfin, la question, qu peut, euh, la question finale que je, je poserai, c'est est-ce qu'il y a véritablement une pathologie euh, du droit L'utilisation du droit peut-elle être pathologique Alors oui, et dans ce cas-là, on peut utiliser la notion d'abus de droit, c'est-à-dire le fait pour une personne de commettre une faute par le dépassement des limites d'exercice d'un droit qui lui est conféré, soit en le détournant de sa finalité, soit dans le but de nuire à autrui. Euh, L'article 17 de la Convention européenne des droits de l'homme euh, le mentionne. En conclusion, euh, le lawfare peut être un outil utile lorsqu'il s'agit de communiquer sur la façon d'utiliser le droit dans les conflits modernes et apparaît comme un substitut aux armes traditionnelles. Le lawfare aussi fonctionne parce qu'il agit sur les valeurs de l'État victime, le respect de l'État de droit, euh, devient alors le talon d'Achille des États démocratiques. Alors devons-nous pour autant renoncer au principe de l'État de droit Je ne le crois pas. Alors, je suis professeur de droit, donc je vais prêcher pour ma paroisse. Il faut combattre le lawfare, à mon avis, par le lawfare, utiliser le droit, parce qu'il reste toujours l'alternative la plus sérieuse à la guerre. Je vous remercie. Merci. Merci, euh, Antida, pour cet euh, <coughs> éclairage doctrinal sur, sur le concept de, de lawfare. Moi, ce que j'en déduis, c'est qu'il y, y a du bon et du, et du mauvais, en fait, dans ce, dans ce concept-là. Il y a des utilisations tout à fait légitimes du droit pour un, un combat particulier et d'autres qui, qui le sont moins. Et si on est optimiste, on peut dire que le fait d'avoir besoin, en tout cas, d'avoir une justification juridique est en tout cas, euh, au moins pour les juristes, un, un, un progrès. Uh, I would like now to give the floor to uh, Stu Eisenstadt to maybe illustrate uh, some more, maybe at the, the political level, uh, this, uh, this notion. Andy Warhol said we should all have 15 minutes of fame. I'm only given 10. Why is there an upswing in lawfare? There's a positive reason. That is that major nation states know it would be catastrophic to engage in shooting wars in a nuclear age. So there's an attempt to achieve the same geopolitical objectives by non-lethal means, disinformation, cyber attacks, and by lawfare. Second, for non-state actors, the Taliban, ISIS, Hamas, the Polisario, and to a lesser extent, the Palestinian Authority, in an age of terrorism, it is a way of rebalancing 
the argument against stronger foes, an inexpensive, asymmetric way to attack stronger rivals. Third, for rising powers like China or for major nuclear powers like Russia, it's a way to enhance their influence with minimum effort on the part of the U.S. and NATO to respond, minimum provocation. For the U.S., in an age of terrorism, it's a way of striking back at terrorists and of flexing economic muscle backed up by the dollar and putting unparalleled economic pressure, as we've seen in this administration, at better terms of trade or better international agreements, even if it means totally and abjectly uh, abandoning international norms and best trade practices. With that as a backdrop, let me give you some very frank and specific examples. For non-state actors, the Taliban and ISIS, whether it's in Syria, Afghanistan, or Iraq, use human shields as a way of protecting themselves against the full brunt of Western response, knowing that the West, the US, NATO, tries to abide by the law of armed conflict and to reduce the degree to which military intervention harms civilians. So they embed themselves in civilian neighborhoods. Hamas shoots its rockets at southern Israel from densely populated civilian neighborhoods. In addition, if we go from there to Morocco, the country we're in, the conflict over the Western Sahara has been made a part of lawfare by the Polisario, backed by Algeria, trying to deny Morocco the opportunity to exploit the natural resources both in Morocco and offshore with fisheries by using legal attacks. This has gone to the UN, it's gone to the European Union, it's gone to the European Court of Justice, and in general, the UN has sided with Morocco and said that as a self-administered territory, as long as Morocco uses the resources and revenues from its exploitation of these resources for the people in the Western Sahara, it's appropriate. And yet, just this very year, 2019, the European Court of Justice, reversing itself from 2018, said no, it was illegal. This was ignored by the European Parliament and the European Commission. That cleared the way for a EU-Morocco fisheries agreement. But again, it's an example. And just last year, a South African court in 2018 upheld South Africa seizing a cargo ship full of phosphates made by OCP, manned by OCP, and kept it there until great political pressure was put in releasing it. The Palestinian issue as a non-state actor is more complicated. I have negotiated during the Clinton administration when I was responsible for the peace process's economic dimension more than a half dozen times with Chairman Arafat. I spent a great deal of time both in Israel and in the territories, and to its credit, the Palestinian Authority does not resort to the kind of violence that Hamas, ISIS, and the Taliban do. Indeed, they cooperate with Israel on security issues, but they have turned to lawfare from their perspective as a way of gaining a two-state solution they can't get at a negotiating table. But from Israel's perspective, it is nothing short of the use of lawfare for what is called BDS, Boycott, Divestment, and Sanction. This began in 2001 at the Durban Conference on Racism in which NGOs were activated by the Palestinian to isolate Israel, to call it an apartheid state. And in 2005, the BDS movement formally started with across the board efforts in the UN, 
in U.S. courts, in every forum possible, in Belgium, in the Netherlands, to sanction Israeli officials, bar them from coming in, sanction Israeli companies. I could give an hour speech just on this alone. Use of the International Criminal Court. It is an effort from Israel's perspective of delegitimizing Israel as a Jewish state rather than simply accomplishing a negotiating a deal by sitting down and making the tough compromises they're not prepared to make. Now let's move from that to China. I was present with President Carter in the cabinet room when Deng Xiaoping made his historic first visit. We normalized, not Nixon, we normalized relations with the People's Republic. And again, I've spent a good deal of time in China as well. The change in China is profound because from Deng Xiaoping's time in 1978, 79, up to President Xi, all Chinese leaders tried, and with great success, to mobilize their internal resources to take hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. President Xi felt that was not enough. He wanted China to become a global power, and they have done so by using lawfare. I'll give you some concrete, very specific examples. The misuse of the UN Convention on the Law of the Seas and the extension of the economic zone. They have taken three coral reefs They've built them out into militarized islands with jet fighters and the like, and then claimed 200-mile jurisdiction as if this was a part of the coastline of China. The Philippines took them to the world court. The Philippines won. China ignored it. I was on the Defense Policy Board in the, in the Obama administration, and we urged, and, the, and Obama did, and Trump has continued, not to allow China to treat the South China Sea as if it was a great lake in the U.S. and to have warships go by that, those islands. But this is a major way of doing it and China has extended this concept of lawfare to aviation law. For example, with the Chicago Convention on International Air Travel, they have taken this concept of militarizing the islands they claim as theirs as an extension of their coastline and have gone up and said you can't go over these islands by using U.S. planes without our permission or Western planes. And they've done it with outer space and with cyberspace as well. Their Belt and Road Initiative is a very, very creative way of extending their influence globally. 750,000 Chinese workers in Africa alone building infrastructure warm water ports for their built-up Navy and their carriers. Just in the last week, the National Basketball Association was threatened with a cutoff of the transmission of their games because one general manager for one of the teams tweeted sympathy for Hong Kong. And ESPN and major airlines are being told to redraw their maps of China to include Taiwan as well. Russia is another example of the extension of lawfare. Putin has very cleverly maximized his influence by doing so. And this fits very much with what Anne said. So what has he done? He's taken over parts of Georgia by handing out fake Russian passports and saying he had to go in to protect the Russians. He has taken over and annexed Crimea and used little green men in eastern Ukraine who he says are not Russian military. And he has abrogated the 1994 Budapest Memorandum in which after the Cold War, Ukraine transferred all of its nuclear weapons to, the, to the Russia in return for an international agreement, which the UK, the US, and others signed on to, that the sovereignty of Ukraine would be protected. 
Well, it hasn't been. And what has been the lawfare excuse by Russia? Responding to simply the popular will of those in the Crimea, of the Russians in eastern Ukraine. We're simply abiding by it, and we're not doing it anyway. It's only the militias responding to popular will. Stuart, your 10 minutes are up, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, I'll close on one positive note. One going back many years to Jimmy Carter and one today. The U.S. and NATO in Afghanistan, in a positive way, are using a new lawfare concept, and that is when they take ISIS out of a territory, they immediately begin to employ the rule of law, set up conflict resolution uh, efforts, and it's an operation called COIN. It's a very creative and positive use of lawfare. And last, my own President Jimmy Carter, I served Clinton and Obama as well, he put human rights at the center of his foreign policy. He applied it to the military dictators in Latin America, cut off their arms, activated the democratic movements there, got thousands of political prisoners released, and did the same thing with the Soviet Union. So there are many examples of positive uses as well that I hope perhaps in the remaining time we can use. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so without further ado, I'll, I'll give the floor to uh, Ambassador Lee uh, for other instances of lawfare. We've learned a new concept tonight and we didn't know how broad it was. Please. Thank you, Chair. I wish to speak this afternoon on the serious threat to the rule-based international order from the international trade perspective based on insight I have gained from my more than 35 years working experience as a, a trade diplomat. I would like to highlight two elements which are currently threatening the rule-based international trade order. First, unilateralism by abuse of national security exception, and second, paralyzing the dispute settlement mechanism of the WTO by abuse of this consensus rule. The crown jewel of Rugai Round agreements was the establishment of a effective dispute settlement mechanism in international trade prohibiting unilateral sanctions by its members. When the Rugai Round of multilateral trade negotiations were finalized after nearly eight years of difficult negotiations, signed here in Marrakesh, setting up the WTO in 1995, all members undertook not to resort to unilateral action, and all the sanctions, therefore, must go through the WTO's dispute settlement mechanism. In recent years, however, the unilateral actions of the most important members of the WTO have reappeared, with these members insisting that they base their action on the international trade rules. For example, the United States has imposed additional tariffs on imported steel and aluminum in March 2017, and is currently exploring the possibility of imposing one on the auto and auto parts, whose importance and impact on the world economy are far behind comparison with steel and aluminum. U.S. defends its action based on Section 232 of Trade Expansion Act of 1962, which authorized the president to take action when its national security is in danger by the import. It justifies its action citing the national security exception of the WTO. As it is not logical nor reasonable to claim that imported steel and aluminum or eventually imported cars from allies, including European Union, Korea, or Japan, it is regarded as an abuse of national security exception of the WTO. The European Union and other members have brought this case to the WTO, which established a panel to examine its consistency with the relevant WTO rules. 
What is more serious than worrisome is that some members have begun to use the national security exception provision of the WTO while they are criticizing the United States, invoking national security to justify the retaliation against the dispute not related to trade is a good example. In this sense, it is very encouraging to see that in a ruling over Ukrainian transit issue with Russia, WTO panel in April confirmed the WTO's right to review national security claims rejecting the traditional argument of the powerful countries that national security is not subject to review, but self-judging. Ladies and gentlemen, in the international trading system, the dispute settlement mechanism of the WTO serves as an independent institution tasked with upholding the rule of law and deterring unilateralism. It is critical, therefore, for our international community to work together to guarantee the proper functioning of WTO dispute settlement mechanism. So it is with a sense of deep disappointment to witness its collapse due to one member's veto of the appointment for new members of WTO appellate body. Coming this September, just one member out of seven will remain on the body. Since the WTO appellate body needs at least three members to deliberate, WTO dispute settlement system will come to a grinding halt by that time. The WTO dispute settlement system with its appellate body has been key to the security and predictability of the multilateral trading system. Without a proper system of enforcement, the multilateral rules can no longer work effectively. The US complains that there is a no effective check on appellate body decisions. The impact of overreaching appellate body decisions create a tradition of stare decisis which has emerged from WTO case law. As a result, panels depart from previous decisions of the appellate body only in rare instances. The appellate body is also criticized for issuing advisory opinions on matters not raised by the parties or not related to the dispute at hand. International trade experts, including myself, sympathize with these US concerns, particularly because the decisions of the panels or appellate body should not result in de facto amendment of the agreement without the consent of its members. In this sense, I can see the broad support for the reform proposal made by the European Union at the end of last year, together with the other members to address the concerns expressed by the United States and at the same time to preserve the overall successful dispute resolution system of the WTO. But it is not certain if a way out of current deadlock could be found. I think the reappearance of unilateralism wherein the members are abusing the national security exception and paralyzing WTO dispute system are two important examples of the weaponization of the law in the international trade. In order to overcome this serious threat to the rule-based international trading system, like-minded countries need to more actively cooperate and unite to uphold the principle of rule of law abiding by the already reached agreements. Before I conclude, I would like to state that though I have highlighted US trade policy in my presentation, I understand and agree with the current US trade policies 
on many points, if not all. And I highly appreciate U.S. contribution in spreading the value of rule of law all over the world and convinced that they will continue to do so in the future. Thank you. Thank you. So it seems like wherever you look, whether international business or international politics or, or trade, uh, the rule of law based system is, uh, is under threat. And so what do the United Nations have to say on that? Mr. Muller. I'm no longer the United Nations. Well, still. <laughs> I retired. Thank you. Thank you to my fellow panel members for so eloquently highlighting some of the specific issues um, of the issue at hand. I'm going to, with your permission, take a little bit more of a bird's eye view and uh, situate what we're talking about in a broader context in which we live. Now, weaponization of law is not a new phenomenon. It's been going on ever since humanity started establishing rules and norms for how we govern ourselves. We use law for good and for bad. We use it to ensure the order, orderly conduct of our lives, but also to rule, and as we've just heard, to subjugate, to gain political, economic, and personal advantage, etc. And we use it to also counter the negative aspects that we've talked about. It is this constant balancing act across history at all levels of our societies between good and evil that has culminated over the past 70 years or so in the absolutely unprecedented and extraordinary levels of peace, rights, and well-being that we have achieved for humanity. The human race has never been better off than it is today. And law, quite obviously, has been and is an indispensable foundation and driver for those advances. Our discussion today is part of a much needed global urgent examination of how we preserve those gains, and more importantly, how we ensure that our succeeding generations will live and can live on a sustainable planet that is able to provide them with a life in health, in peace, and in dignity. I'm neither a lawyer or an academic, I'm a practitioner on the international stage for over the past four decades. And it's as such that I'd like to reflect a bit on where we are now and on where and how we should go next. Underlying the framing of our debate today on the weaponization of law and globalization is a pervasive concern that fundamental tenets of the international and indeed national order are fraying. And it's true. The implicit self-evidence with which we, up till just a few years ago, treated the rule of law as the natural order within a state and the liberal rule-based uh, rule system between state today almost seems naive. The fundamental questions about the way our world is governed have been thrown wide open once again. And today, we are faced with a massive trust deficit, growing inequality. People ask whether democracy is still viable, Powerful actors on the world stage propagate the end of multilateralism. A new fascination for authoritarianism has penetrated our discourse. Laws, rules, norms, and standards are systematically being misused or ignored entirely. And the world is increasingly polarized. Political debate today is reminiscent of what Hannah Arendt wrote about the 1920s and 30s, that any statement of fact becomes a question of motive. And the debates are decided by allegiance, not by arguments. Populists the world over have pushed us into a us versus them scenario, the people against the establishment, the locals versus the immigrants, and similar false dichotomies. Structural economic polarization is rampant and growing. A handful of men own more than the bottom half of humanity, while entire regions and countries are failing to catch up to the waves of progress left behind in the rust belts of the world, a totally unsustainable situation. And when people see a select few seemingly living by a different set of rules, avoiding taxes, manipulating loopholes, legal loopholes, this naturally further feeds a strong sense of injustice. Deepening polarization in our political debate and rampant inequality in our economic affairs have created a dangerous seedbed for discontent. It stretches the fabric of society to the breaking point, and it undermines trust in the rules and institutions that govern our societies. We're also witnessing a dramatic diffusion of power. The central role of the nation state 
as we know it, is decreasing, is decreasing as we speak. For example, mayors of big urban centers, private businesses, NGOs, rich and powerful individuals, today exert influence on the global stage and a global scale. At this stage, this new polycentric or multi-stakeholder system is more fluid and unstable than the balance of power that preceded it. That may change. In addition to all this, of course, are the major existential changes and threats facing us in an increasingly aggressive manner every day. The effects of climate change, the rapid evolution of technology, present and future migration patterns, the increasing prevalence of health emergencies, growing inequality, corruption, terrorism, etc. And I would add another important existential change. For the past several years, and until today or until very recently, we have used the past to navigate and manage our present. Today, we are increasingly faced with the reality that it is the future that determines our present. We are living a major transformation of our world and a major transition in the tools that we have to manage it. Clearly, in this context, the multilateral model and the laws that underpin it that have served us so well over the past seven decades are no longer up to the task of dealing with the problems I've just enumerated. And at this time of dysfunction and transition in global and local power relations and governance structures, there looms the additional risk of the world splitting in two, as we spoke of this morning, with the two largest economies creating two separate and competing worlds, each with their own dominant currency, trade and financial rules, their own internet and artificial intelligence capacities, their own zero-sum geopolitical and military strategies, and with their own, and at times, very distinct interpretation of the law. These realities are a further strain on the international legal framework, which is increasingly out of step with developments on the ground. Just think of how far behind the global norms and rules are relative to the breathtaking and rapid advances in autonomous weapons, cyber warfare, and the arms race in artificial intelligence. We have, we have been discussing, and the world over we're discussing globalization, uh, uh, in some cases in very negative terms. As far as I'm concerned, globalization is really not a four-letter word. Whether you like it or not, it is an operational and very potent reality that, trans that frames every human activity on our planet. But what we need to do is now to elaborate a new multilateral approach that is more networked, more inclusive, and more collaborative. One that fully embraces our increasing interdependence and delivers governance structures that are flexible, people-centered, and that help us ensure that we leave no one behind. One that is based on the clear collective understanding that if we don't, our very existence is at stake. In all of this, law had, has, and will have a determining role in how things unfold. We have to find, and we will have to find, new ways of establishing the rules for the successful management of our future. Ways that are adapted to the speed at which developments are unfolding, particularly on the big ticket items I mentioned earlier, especially climate and technology. We no longer have the luxury of time to sit and elaborate treaties over many years. Now we have to include multiple actors. I think that the days of governments as the sole actor in these areas is fast coming to an end. One source of inspiration for the way to do this are the Paris Climate Agreement and the 2030 Development Agenda with its 17 SDGs, our global roadmap for fixing what ails the world, which were, uh, which were negotiated and agreed in an inclusive and voluntary approach that are not legally binding. A rules-based multilateral governance model is, I think, the only way forward. If some of us, as is happening today, include, including some of the big players, persist in thinking that they can manage their and our problems on their own, we will collectively not make it. And this also means upholding and preserving the ability of my old employer, the United Nations, and I hasten to say a very reformed United Nations, which remains the only genuinely global and genuinely neutral table around which all actors can come together on an equal footing. It means engaging with and supporting the multilateral breakthroughs 
that did happen in recent years. Above all, what I just mentioned, the Sustainable Development Goals, which are key vehicles for promoting the rule of law on a global as much as a local scale. The 2030 Agenda is critical in guiding our strategic response. We cannot successfully deal with the multiplicity of challenges we face either regionally, sequentially, or in isolation. That is true for climate change, it's true for combating inequality, and it's certainly also true in our collective struggle to uphold the rule of law. That will only become more important in a world that is rapidly becoming multipolar, even though it may remain bipolar for a few more years. Which is yet another reason why the only viable way forward is multilateral. Not a multilateralism of the past, but one that recognizes the transformation of recent years. A multilateralism that is intergovernmental, but that implicates and empowers other actors on the international stage, from civil society to business, etc. A networked, inclusive multilateralism. We have the knowledge, we have the expertise, we have the human and financial resources to do so, and uh, all we need is a little bit more will. Thank you very much. For <clears throat> replacing our topic in a, the broader background of, all of the transitions we're going through, and for this uh, vibrant advocacy of a reform multilateralism in which law would <coughs> remain the, the cornerstone. So I think uh, I'd like to uh, take questions from the audience uh, right away because the time is short and we've covered a lot of ground. So uh, let's start here. Mike. Thank you. My name is Pei Emerson, entrepreneur in education and communication, okay. coming from Sweden. I will just have lots of interest to Stuart Eisenstadt about how the law can be used. Uh, and I want to put the question to you about United States, because we have a number of issues in Europe when it comes to corruption and money laundering in European companies. And even if those companies only have 0.1% activity in the US, it's being handled by US authorities. US authorities outsource the work to law firms, and then European firms have to pay millions or billions of US dollars. And I don't think they should, they, of course they should pay when they've done mistakes, but what I can't understand is why we haven't got the system within European community to handle this. Why should it be US jurisdiction that controls the world in this area. Thank you. Maybe we're going to take two or three questions uh, and then we'll, we'll respond. Yes, uh, the, the lady out there. Uh, no, no. Here, I think there was a question. Uh, we'll take three questions. Please be, be brief. Uh, my question is to Mr. Eistat. Um, Dania Khatib from um, Isam Faris uh, Institute at the American University of Beirut. You spoke about the Palestinian and their use of lawfare. Uh, what other option do they have when the Israeli slowly eat up their land and build settlement and there is no international pressure to compel Israel for the two-state solution? What other option do the Palestinians have? Okay, and I also want to tell you that while Barak was negotiating with Arafat. He was bragging that he built settlements more than any other prime minister. Thank you. Thank you. Third question here, and then we'll, we'll respond. Hi. Uh, I'm Daniel Shek. I'm a former Israeli diplomat. I would love to hear someone expand a little bit about a notion that was mentioned uh, at the beginning of the uh, universal jurisdiction. Um, there is, of course, uh, the one sort which is within the international bodies that have been created and regulated through agreements like the ICC, but there are also individual states which have acquired uh, different levels uh, of uh, universal jurisdiction, which creates a somewhat uncertain and unclear and fluid legal landscape, uh, especially in Europe. 
so I wonder if somebody would uh, like to say what, what they think this is worth and is, is it still a useful tool when there are uh, recognized international bodies that have to deal with it? Okay, thank you. We'll uh, take up maybe uh, if we start with the last question. Uh, Antida, do you want to answer this, okay. the Professor? Um, universal jurisdiction. I think uh, for some authors, uh, it's uh, a law for a problem because uh, effectively you have individual states who use the universal jurisdiction to uh, uh, fight against a uh, specific individual. Uh, for Pinochet, for example, you have action against Tony Blair uh, as well, uh, from Belgium and so on, and uh, for Brangel and so on. Uh, I don't think so. I think that uh, universal jurisdiction, it's, uh, it's not a lawfare argument because uh, it's based on uh, universal convention. So it's an obligation for the state who are party to this convention to respect their obligation. And uh, if this convention, this international convention, mentions the universal jurisdiction, they have to. Uh, respect this uh, convention obligation. So I don't think it's lawfare. It's a legitimate use uh, of law, uh, and uh, you have this obligation if you are party of uh, uh, of this convention. So uh, I'm not sure it's yeah, local, local, but. Most of the time, you have, uh, uh, you have an obligation uh, based on international convention. Even if you, uh, if you act as an individual state, uh, according to your uh, national uh, law, you, have an international you can have an international obligation to uh, use uh, universal jurisdiction. That's why for me, it's, uh, uh, it's not lawfare because it doesn't use to destabilize the other parts. It's, not, it's only a conventional obligation. Yeah, I think the problem is to draw the limit between the legitimate and the illegitimate use of law between the legal and the illegal use of law. Stuart, Palestinian lawfare and extraterritoriality as well. I'll answer all three. On the last <laughs> point, uh, it is a use of lawfare. It's an inappropriate use of lawfare. Uh, the Dutch, the British, the Belgians use it as a way of asserting jurisdiction over actors who aren't their citizens and who they say have committed war crimes, including a private corporation that I happen to represent in the Netherlands who had a leased business with construction equipment that was used in the West Bank. And he was arrested and uh, he spent three or four years trying to avoid it. Now, with respect to the Palestinians and the question, the first question on uh, the financial situation. Uh, I understand exactly your point on the Palestinians. Let me point out, if I may, and I've been engaged in these negotiations for a very long time in many administrations. At Camp David II, under Clinton, Prime Minister Barack offered 95% of the West Bank East Jerusalem is the capital of a new Palestinian state. 50,000 refugees coming back permanently to Israel. Arafat, who I had negotiated with just two weeks before and who told me, don't have President Clinton invite me to Camp David because I'm not willing to make the compromises he wants. They couldn't give up the law of their so-called right of return. Uh, several years later, Prime Minister Olmer at 96% of the West Bank, East Jerusalem was the capital, 50,000 refugees. Abbas turned it down. And by the way, Arafat created the second intifada uh, when he turned this down. There's no question but that we have a government in Israel that is not predisposed, to say the least, to these kinds of negotiations. But if the Palestinians had had a Martin Luther King, if they had had someone who was willing in a nonviolent way to say, everything is on the table. We are willing to accept, as Oslo, they did, a Jewish state. We want our state, and we're willing to negotiate, as we did not do uh, in Camp David II and uh, in uh, Omer's time. We would have a completely different situation. 
It would turn the tables and there wouldn't be a need. They use lawfare because they're not willing in the end to make the final decision that they're not going to have a million and a half refugees coming back to Haifa and to Tel Aviv. That's sensitive. With respect to the financial situation, the answer is in one word, the dollar. I mean, the dollar is the king. Uh, you can't do business without the dollar. The euro no. is not a comparison. Now, having said that, I, I have to conclude because I, I am not a defender of all the things we've done. With the war on terror, until the U.S. Supreme Court said we couldn't do it, we had extrajudicial, after 9-11, assassinations and abductions. We created in Guantanamo a situation in which to avoid U.S. law, we used torture in order to extract confessions, trying to come into a hole saying, well, they're not a U.S. court. The Supreme Court turned that down. We have a president, and uh, my colleague from South Korea, who actually served together in Brussels, nailed it right on the trade issue. But let me go beyond that. How can we have, Michael, an international rule of order when we have a president who has withdrawn from agreements reached by his predecessors, which never have been done before? The Paris Accord, the JCPOA nuclear agreement, the Trans-Pacific Partnership with 12 countries, uh, the, you know, all of these, the INF Treaty with Russia, all of these things have been unilaterally withdrawn from. I mean, you talk about governance, my goodness, how can we urge any kind of rule of law on other countries when we abrogate agreements that previous presidents had reached in good faith? I'll close with one example. Jimmy Carter negotiated the SAL II nuclear agreement. It was never ratified by the Senate for reasons which I mentioned in my book, but it's not relevant here. Reagan took over, polar opposite ideology. He and the Soviets abided by SALT II as if it had been ratified till the last day it was due to expire because he respected what his predecessor had done. Before taking three questions on this side of the room, I'd like just to answer your question a little more specifically, because why aren't the European, why isn't European doing the job? Because until very recently, Europeans did nothing on anti-corruption. In France, bribes were tax deductible until the OECD convention went into force in 2000. And it's only two years ago that we've got a law that the UK also acted. So it's just starting, and it's a good thing. But until now, they left the floor open to, to the US, which has been the anti-corruption policeman of the world. So things are changing, but that's mainly the reason. So there's one question here, two questions, second question here. Go ahead, sir. Alors, ma question s'adresse à Madame Anne Tiga. Et euh, le président Bush, après les attentats du 11 septembre, lorsqu'il a traité l'Irak et l'Afghanistan d'État voyous, est-ce qu'on peut considérer ça comme du lawfare Merci. Sure. Question là. Hello, Nadia Moti, University Mohammed V, professor. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm very curious to know how can the law prevail if the law is here to protect minorities, to protect certain issues worldwide, and you lawyers cannot do something to uh, do what we call the firewalls for computers, how can the law prevail and make something like good for the hu humanity? Thank you. Okay, a third question on either side there. Thank you so much. My name is Joseph Maila. I'm an academic from France. My question is to follow the issue that was raised at the previous panel concerning the weaponization of dollar. We heard from the gentleman from Russia that dollar, the dollar as a currency is considered as a common international public good. And at the same time, the doctrine of the Trump administration was to state when it comes to the sanctions against Iran that the dollar was a national currency. So nobody is allowed or authorized to use the dollar in order to go, not to abide by the sanctions that have been put by the administration. My question is very simple, and it comes to the legal side of it. I mean, do you consider, from the legal point of view, it's if 
this is not a law fair, what could it be? But from the um, legal point of view, is it legal to consider that your currency, which is the universal currency, as I might say, or the world currency, is at the same time a national currency and that you could put your law and make your law prevail on not the international uh, legislation, I don't know if, if there is a legislation, but it is jeopardizing the whole trade system. Thank you so much. Okay, so until I think the, maybe the, certainly the first question, maybe the second <laughs> is addressed to you. Sur l'état voyou, euh, je crois que c'est pas du lawfare, encore une fois, parce que je serais pour une, une définition plus stricte du lawfare, parce que l'état voyou, déjà, c'est pas un argument juridique, en fait. C'est une qualification politique qui vise à euh, stigmatiser des états et à justifier éventuellement euh, l'adoption de, 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 de sanctions. Mais il n'y a pas d'argument juridique dans la qualification d'état voyou. Or, pour moi, le lawfare, c'est vraiment l'utilisation du droit et des armes juridiques, enfin des, des, des instruments juridiques pour déstabiliser euh, le, le, la partie euh, adverse. Michael, do you want to answer the, 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 the second question, maybe about uh, protection of or, or who, anybody else? No? Or, or Antida? Or? No? Uh, <laughs> je ne sais pas répondre à la question. <laughs> Question sans réponse. Number of people. First of all, when you asked about lawyers, I mean, if the world has to depend on lawyers to solve our problems, we're certainly in not in great shape. But let me talk about the dollar because it's obviously a neuralgic issue. A number of people have asked about it. I, I see uh, Mr. Trichet here, who's done so much for the European Central Bank to create uh, a viable euro. And I was head ambassador of the EU in the Clinton administration when the euro was just about to get started. So we have done things during the Clinton administration that were multilateral and that not, did not abuse our power. For example, we created, and it still exists, a, a, a global system for dealing with anti-money laundering. We had a common agreement, know your customer, all of these things were agreed to. We even listed a number of countries, including Israel and Russia, and Lichtenstein that did not meet those standards. Uh, second, if you want a great example of the dollar versus the euro, look at what's happened since the US unilaterally pulled out of the JCPOA. The European Union, and rightly so, wanted to keep Iran in that agreement. They tried to come up with alternative financing mechanisms so that there could be trade with Iran and Iran would get some of the benefits of the JCPOA in return for having given up two-thirds of their centrifuges, their heavy water system, 24-7 IAEA inspection, and the like. And it didn't work. And it didn't work because any multinational company, even a Europe-based company, has to do business with the United States. It's the biggest market. And if the US, and I wish we hadn't done it, pulled out and said, we're going to sanction you if you do business with Iran, Europe was powerless to counteract that, even though it's a 500 million people market, larger than ours. We have 325 million. But the euro, with all the advances it's made under Mr. Trichet and, and, and under his successor, who, who saved it, uh, uh, Draghi, it's not a global currency. It's not an alternative currency. And so there's no country in the, uh, no company in the world, if given the choice between doing business with Iran and doing business with the US, it's a no-brainer. And that's why this agreement is falling apart. I mean, you talk about global governance. My God, we had a situation. It wasn't perfect. It was not a perfect agreement. There were sunset problems and so forth. OK, we could have built on that. Now, in retaliation, Iran is restarting its centrifuges. It's talking about going back to its heavy water plant. It's enriching uranium up to a dangerous level when it was at a very low level. It's a catastrophe in terms of any kind of international governance. But it's undergirded by the strength of the dollar, by the strength of the dollar. And so Trump can get away with it because no company, again, is going to choose to do business with Iran 
and hope that the, e, the EU's alternative finance mechanism works. It won't. It's a shame, but that's the reality of it. Just, just one to answer the, the technical question uh, there. Uh, there's often a misconception that the whole, the sole uh, ground for jurisdiction is the use of the dollar or of the U.S. financial system. But most of the time, there are other grounds for jurisdiction. If you take the, the famous BNP case, if you have a U.S. banking license, whether you use the dollar or the euro, you're subject to U.S. jurisdiction. That's, that's the legal answer. So it's not all about the dollar. There are other, uh, of course, as I said, in the current Iranian section, there's a big split of foreign policy between Europe and the United States, which makes the sanction very, you know, unacceptable. But in areas where there is a common ground, the, the, the legal ground are not only about the use of the dollar, but people often forget that. Uh, so just the, the economic power of the U.S. Look, look, against South Korea was used by this administration to get a better deal for agriculture. Okay? It was used against Mexico and against Canada, our two great neighbors, to get a better deal on NAFTA. It's been used against China to our detriment as well, but to get a better deal, and there'll be some deal, current Trump, Trump will call it the best deal ever. It won't be, but okay. So the, the, the power of the U.S. economy has to be used very delicately, but it's, when it's used with a bludgeon, is what's being used now, it does produce some results, but with terrible after effects and aftershocks that will be years in, in, in recreating and going back to a rules based system. I think Jean Claude Trichet had a question or comment? Oh. Thank you very much indeed. No, I only wanted to echo what you just said, uh, both, both of you. I think when I uh, ask the major European multinationals. It is not because they are bound to have transaction with the Iran in dollars. They could do that in other currencies. And of course, the euro exists. And uh, as a matter of global transactions, the rapport de force, if I may, is not uh, dramatic. I mean, it's 45% for the dollar, 34 for the euro, something like that. The problem is, as you said, they have interest, other interests in the US. And if they don't respect the legislation and the sanctions, then they are punished, not because they are utilizing the dollar, but because they have a lot, of course, of trade or interest or FDI in the United States. And that explains, in my observation, why immediately the major European multinationals said, no, forget about it, uh, about us. And so the, the special purpose vehicle was not utilized, at least by them, which was some kind of uh, of nice barter, utilizing the euro. But again, the, the main problem is that legislation in the US, it seems to me, is perceived by the multinational is really, really overwhelmingly threatening. I mean, the okay. use of secondary sanctions, I'll give you a perfect example of how two administrations can differ. So when I was under Secretary of State in the Clinton administration, I negotiated with the European Union on the Iran-Libya Sanctions Act, which was a secondary sanction. That is to say, not against U.S. companies alone, but against European companies who were doing business with Iran or under Helms Burton doing business with Cuba. It was perfectly legal under European law and not under ours, and we tried to enforce it with secondary sanctions. But I negotiated waivers in both cases with the European companies so we didn't have to actually use those sanctions, and we got in return things like a commitment in terms of investment in Cuba. Okay, you can invest, but do more to promote democracy and reach out to democratic groups. Okay, you can invest in Iran, but don't do dual-use products. So, I mean, there are ways to handle these secondary sanctions in sensible ways, but when we have a situation as we have today where there are sort of no limits, then you really get a very, very significant problem in the whole global governance system. We're going to take one or two last questions. Jean-Claude Bruffin. On just, uh, I was for many years a French banker in the United States, and then I became an American banker in Europe. So I've come across many of the situations that you were talking about. Uh, and in the case of BNP, uh, one thing that people don't always understand, BNP was warned by 
the Department of Financial Services in New York, not the Fed, not the administration, the Department of Financial Services, which is under the governor of the state of New York, Andrew Cuomo, was warned that they were doing transactions that were not confirmed to U.S. legislation. It was done out of Paribas, BNP Paribas in Switzerland. So they went to Switzerland and told them, don't do this transaction, they are not confirmed to what they did, they continued doing this transaction. And effectively, that was a payment that was for Sudan, oil export to Sudan. And that, that was done using uh, two banks, BNP and another bank, that were not American banks. And to make sure that they didn't go through, the, they thought they wouldn't go through the financial system in the US, they used the BNP branch in New York to clear the transaction. As you know, if you make a dollar payment, every dollar payment clears by 8 p.m. New York Times in New York through the Fed system. So these transactions were in the US financial system. Regardless of the way they were structured, they mm. ended up being in the US financial system and clear to the Fed. Mm. And that's why the Fed imposed, and, and the sanction, the financial sanction was $9 billion, as you know. One third of it went to the Department of Justice, one third went to the Department of Financial Services, and one third went to the Fed. So, so, so is there, I agree. Yeah. Let me, this is really an important point. Let, let me just make, it's really a, important to understand this. Whenever one thinks about the JCPOA, the nuclear deal with Iran, and again, it's imperfect, it's much better than the alternative, but whatever one thinks about it, it is unmistakable that the reason Iran came back to the negotiating table and agreed to the JCPOA was not because of our unilateral sanctions. It was because we got our allies in Europe to join with us who were also concerned about Iran's nuclear plan. And what did they do? Europe gave up 16% of all of its energy imports. It stopped importing all the oil from Iran. It agreed on the SWIFT system in Brussels that they wouldn't clear transactions. They agreed with us to sanction the Central Bank of Iran, Mr. Truchet, the Central Bank of Iran. If, if we had done that alone, it wouldn't have worked. So here we pull out of an agreement that the European Union sweated bullets to help us get. And now they're trying desperately to hang on to it and don't have the financial wherewithal to do it. It's really a tragedy. And it's not a way to treat your allies who sacrificed for us. You know, President Trump just said, when we, when he's talking about unilateral actions, when we decided we were getting out of Syria and Turkey comes in, and he said about the Kurds who lost 20,000 men fighting with us against ISIS, where were they in Normandy? Bien, on m'a donné instruction de clore le débat. Je crois que notre hôte du dîner est ponctuel, comme l'a rappelé Thierry Montbrial ce matin. Donc je, je vous remercie tous de, de vos interventions, de vos questions, et j'espère que... Voilà.